Good morning. Butch Eichels, the Country Church, Marion, Texas. A short drive to worship the Lord in a relaxed atmosphere. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the live stream from the Country Church. We're glad to have you with us, joining us tonight. It's a very special night um, at sundown this evening. Passover begins as we head into this holy weekend of Good Friday and then Resurrection Sunday. And so it's a, it's a very spiritual moment, but it's also a moment that uh, we are still... Uh, in a warfare with this coronavirus, and we are praying and we are asking the Lord to pass over uh, this nation and this world. And so we're going to worship together tonight uh, as we head into Passover, and then um, we're going to have a message from the Word together, and we thank you for joining us. Um, this coronavirus is a respiratory uh, infection. It's a it's a bug that attacks uh, attacks the respiratory systems, and and there's a song that just I think says that Lord, you you fill our lungs with your breath, and so maybe we could start there tonight as we worship Him. It's your breath in our lungs, and so we pour out our praise to you tonight, Lord Jesus. You give life, you are love, you bring light to the darkness, you give hope, you restore every heart. Right. These bones will sing great. 
that river I will shine in glorious light When he calls me home I'll fall at his throne And forever worship Christ And forever worship Christ And forever worship Christ I'll forever worship Christ Not the same I am changed, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. By His grace, I am saved. I'm His child forever, I am. Not the same, I am changed, redeemed by the blood of Thank the Lord that we can praise him on a Wednesday night as well as we can praise him on a Sunday morning. We thank the Lord always for his word. We don't ever, ever want to have a service without his word. We thank the Lord for the word of God and want to preach it as it is to people as they are. Tonight it's good to have Brother James Morris to come and to bring the word to us tonight, and we're going to pray God will bless him in a special way. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, it's so good for us to be here. It's so good to be under the word of God. Father, we pray for those out there who may not have the word. And Father, are struggling with things as they are. And Father, we pray that even tonight, if they catch this live stream, Lord, that they'd give attention to the Word of God and lives would be changed by the power of the gospel and we'll be careful that all the praise and all the honor and all the glory would go to Jesus, for he alone is worthy. Amen. James, if you'll come. Good evening, everyone. I would like to open in prayer, but I would tell you first that you need your Bible and you need it to be in 1 Samuel chapter 1 for tonight's message. As we pray, Almighty God, creator of man and all that is in the world, hear the prayer of your servant. Hide him behind the cross of Christ our Lord. Give him voice to relate the truth of your word and to encourage our membership in this time of unrest in our nation. Our nation founded on these words, we the people, find ourselves in a battle against an unseen virus that has entered our nation. This unseen virus is not a respecter of persons. It affects the rich and the poor, the young and the old, the tall and the short, the skinny and the not so skinny, the people regardless of race or creed, and indeed the powerful and the weak. Help us to focus on your power and glory to win victory over this pandemic. Let us lay aside the political views of some for the good of all. 
Let us unite as we the people to persevere against this unseen enemy. But most of all, let us dedicate ourselves to prayer and fasting and seek you as never before to intervene and bring relief to our nation. Let our people humble themselves and confess the sins of ourselves, our fathers, and our forefathers in the past and seek your assistance in this time of trouble. Let us dedicate our whole being to intercede on behalf of the infirmed and the stricken for their healing and recovery. Let, all, let us all be a beacon of hope and faith in this hour of need in America. Let us recover the joy of our salvation and direct others to Christ in this hour. Let us remember those on the front lines, the doctors, the nurses, and indeed the first responders, police, military, our president and elected officials, and give them divine insight in how to handle each case and situation that will bring you glory. We ask these things in the name of Jesus our Lord, amen. As you're turning into 1 Samuel chapter one, in the beginning I would remind you to, in your faith walk with our Lord Jesus to don't give up, don't give out, and don't give in, but indeed to stay the course of prayer and faith in Jesus our Lord. It is said that Fidel Castro, the notorious Cuban dictator, recently offered to send supervisors to a new presidential election if asked by the United States. As generous as his offer was, I doubt that we, he will be getting a phone call anytime soon. A communist dictator probably doesn't have any exper expertise that the U.S. can use to help grease the wheels of a democracy. I can understand why the U.S. government won't be asking Castro for help, but I don't understand why Christians are slow to ask God for help. I know we trust him, so why do we suffer from an epidemic of prayerlessness in America? Matthew chapter 7, verse 7 says, Ask and you shall be given, it shall be given to you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened to you. I would like to share some gleanings from chapter 1, verses 1 through 8. Today I want to communicate the principles of prayer from a woman who prayed. The Bible says the effectual, fervent prayers of a righteous man or woman availeth much, James chapter 5, verse 16. Hannah prayed and God gave her a son. What can we learn from Hannah? The situation in verse 1 through 8 is simple. God never is surprised by our prayer request. Elkanah, which means provided by God, was a Levite from the Bethlehem area. Her later city name that would be called Ramah. He had two wives, Benaiah, which means pearl, she had children, and Hannah, Grace, who had no children. Elkanah and his family traveled to Shiloh yearly to worship and to sacrifice to the Lord. When it came time to offer the sacrifice, Elkanah gave portions to Peniah, her sons and her daughters, and he gave Hannah a worthy portion, for he loved Hannah. It was the time of the solemn feast, but the Lord had shut up the womb of Hannah. Benaiah provoked Hannah sorely to make her feel and worry about the situation of having no children. This happened not once, but year after year. Hannah was so upset that she wept and did not eat. Elkanah said, Hannah, why do you weep? And why do you not eat? Why is your heart grieved? Don't I treat you better than if you had ten sons? Hannah was so upset that she wept and did not eat. Hannah asked those words. In the military, I learned early on, if mama ain't happy, ain't nobody happy. That means your wife. It is important for a husband to keep his wife indeed happy. And indeed, we find that Hannah was not. Additionally, we discovered in this chapter that Eli was the priest of the Lord that he had two sons, Hophni, which means fighter, and Phinehas, which means a brazen mouth, who shared in the worship and sacrifices. Moving on to verses 9 through 13, we see Hannah's prayer and Hannah's vow. God was aware of Hannah's desire for a male child. In verse 9 it says, So Hannah rose up after they had eaten in Shiloh and after they had drunk. When Eli, the, now Eli the priest set upon a seat by the post of the temple of the Lord. 
and she was in bitterness of soul and prayed unto the Lord and wept sore. She vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if thou wilt indeed look on the afflictions of thy handmaid and remember me and not forget thy handmaid, but will give unto thy handmaid a man-child, then I will give him unto the Lord all the days of his life, and there shall no razor come upon his head. And it came to pass as she continued praying before the Lord that Eli marked her mouth. Now Hannah, she spake in her heart, and only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. Therefore Eli thought she had been drunken. We find some things that are interesting here. You see, Hannah knew how to pray. She not only understood fasting and prayer, but it also demonstrates her seriousness in solving the situation. And when you are in fasting and prayer, you must have a purpose. And her purpose was to get God's attention and to ask him to give her a son. It says in verse 11, give unto thy handmaid a man child. Hannah not only prayed unto the Lord and wept sore, it says in Samuel verse 10, 1 Samuel 1.10, you must plead the case of yourself. You must plead the case of others that you're interceding for as you pray before the Lord. Many of you have fasted and prayed before when led by the Spirit, and God has responded and answered those prayers in those days. Sometimes we even cry out to God when moved by the Spirit. It says that she wept and didn't eat in verse 7 of first chapter of Samuel. Consecrate, concentrating on the Lord, concentrating on his word, and concentrating on an unfilled need, and indeed concentrating on the Lord's ability to answer her prayer. Observed by Eli, Hannah prayed her prayer within, and was a vow was made unto the Lord. And it says that she sought the Lord of hosts, the Lord, the God of the fighting angels of heaven itself she sought. Hannah recognized that God was a powerful God and she expected a powerful answer when she prayed. Understand the basic premise of prayer. The size of your God de determines the size of your prayer request. The size of your prayer request determines the size of your prayer request answer, by the way. The name Lord of Hosts is a powerful name and an effective name by which to pray. Praying in the name of Jesus is a powerful prayer in and of itself. Hannah knew the place of prayer. Notice that she went to the temple. God's house shall be a house of prayer. Sometimes we forget that in our lives, but God's house is to be a house of prayer and a place of people who pray. She came to the temple because that was where the presence of the Lord was located, there at the temple. There at the tabernacle, the temple itself had not been built in Jerusalem till some hundred years later or so. But indeed, she came to that tent. It says in Psalm 22, 3, the Lord dwelleth in the praises of his people. That when his people are praising him, it's a wonderful thing to know that. Again, the Lord dwelleth between the cherubim in 1 Samuel 4, 4, it says, which means that in that day God dwelled in the tabernacle. So you went to where God was and you prayed, you see. Today, obviously, God dwells in the heart of every believer. And God is everywhere present, which we call his omnipresence. But in the Old Testament, the presence of God was symbolized by the tabernacle. Today, the church is the body of Christ, where two or three are gathered together, and by name I am there also, Christ would say. I believe God is here tonight because more than two of us are here tonight to worship God. He is, he is present with each of us in the Comforter, the Holy Spirit, to carry on his work within each to enlighten and lead us in our faith walk with Jesus. The church is not the only place one can pray and communicate with God. Indeed, Moses prayed in the wilderness. In the great cathedral of God's creation, he spoke to God. Think about the beauty of Alaska, and all of that is a wonderful place sometimes to praise God. Elijah prayed on a mountaintop, and God called, and he called down fire to consume an offering to the one true God of Israel, Yahweh himself, or Jehovah, as sometimes we say. 
Daniel prayed in his house after being told not to pray except in the emperor's name. He obeyed God and not the emperor, but spoke freely about his God and to his God. He didn't hide his faith. Nehemiah prayed in the king's presence, requesting permission to go and rebuild the walls of Jerusalem to keep the enemy out. Jesus prayed in the garden. He sweat great drops of blood the night before his crucifixion and trial. You see, the disciples prayed in the upper room after Jesus' crucifixion. And Paul prayed in prison when arrested for preaching Christ Jesus as the promised Messiah. Peter prayed on a rooftop to see God meant for all the gospel to go out unto all the people groups of the world. God had to give him a vision. Hannah knew the work of prayer. Every time you pray, it costs you something. Effective prayer cost Hannah something. Hannah was intense. Hannah was childless. And Hannah was completely committed to serving the Lord. Hannah knew the work of prayer. Every time you pray, we talked about that already. Notice the Bible describes her prayer. She was in bitterness of soul and prayed unto the Lord and wept in ten. And it came to pass that she continued to pray in verse 12. There are indeed some enemies that you must watch out for. Stress of life itself can keep us from praying. The actions of others, our children and our grandchildren can distract from our prayer life. Our neighbors and friends can do the same thing. Anxiety over the fears of life itself can take away our desire to pray. Physical weariness can keep us from praying. Sometimes when we feel road hard and put away wet, we don't feel much like praying, but I guarantee you that if you pray, you'll find it's an uplifting experience even in those times. Busyness can keep us from our prayer life, and we need to, indeed, we must form habits when we pray. Apparently, Hannah had a time, Hannah had a place, and Hannah had a commitment to prayer. I would challenge you to form a habit concerning the specific time of day that you pray, that you would have also a specific place to pray in, that you would also always have a prayer list to follow each day, and you would support all of that by being a Bible reading pattern that allows you to read the Word of God on a daily basis. Hannah made a vow, you see, that when we think about it, she asked for a man-child. And if God would answer her prayer, she would dedicate the child unto the Lord, to Adoniah, the God of Israel. Israel, you see, Hannah was a serious woman of faith. And not only wanted a male child, but indeed she was willing to give him over to the Lord's work if she bore him. But more than that, she would give him into the service of the Lord to serve God all the days of his life. In addition, she would dedicate him to have no razor to touch his hair set aside for the use of the Lord, living the life in obedience unto the Lord as a Nazarene. And he would be doing this thing because she had prayed for it and asked for it. There's a confrontation between Eli and Hannah in verses 14 and 16. God was aware of the situation within the temple staff and would later address it, you see. And Eli said unto her, How long will thou be drunken? Put away thy wine from thee. And Hannah answered and said, No, my Lord, I am a woman of sorrowful spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but have poured out my soul before the Lord. Count not thy handmaid for a daughter of Baal, for out of the abundance of my complaint and grief have I spoken hitherto. Hannah knew the openness of prayer. When you pray, you expose yourself to God. Notice that Hannah poured out her heart before the Lord in verse 15. Hannah was completely open toward God. When you want to be an effective prayer warrior, you must confess your sins. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness, you see. 1 John 1, 9. And we repent of those sins. 
2 Chronicles 7, 14 says, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, I will hear from heaven and I will heal their land. You must forgive your debtors as you ask God to forgive you. The Lord's Prayer tells us to ask God to forgive our debts as we forgive our debtors. Bear no grudges, seek no revenge. Be open to God for answers. Call unto me, and I will answer thee, and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. Jeremiah 33, 3. Hannah knew the inner position of prayer. Many people pray in many different positions. Some stand, some walk, some kneel, some lie prostrate on the floor, some sit on a chair, some kneel by a chair, some kneel by a bed, or some like to come to the church altar, and some while they're driving down the road and seeing God's beauty. Indeed, sometimes we need to pray for those other drivers to cut us off, play blessings up on them, not curses, by the way. The best position in prayer is the inner position. As we see in Hannah, in that position, your heart kneels. Even when the body cannot kneel, God saw Hannah's inner position. And it is a great insight. It has been said on numerous occasions that God saw what was needed. God heard what was needed. And God answered and brought what was needed, you see. Hannah knew the motives in prayer. I knew the motives in my prayer when Ann, my wife, had a stroke while recovering from surgery in the hospital. Standing in the hallway next to Pastor Alan Murphy, we prayed for her recovery or for God to call her home. God answered my prayer and granted us 70 days together before the Lord called her into his presence. I thank my Lord for his gift of those 70 days to bring her home to Texas and all that was involved. Her home going was peaceful, as it should be for all believers in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, you see. We are not stepping out, but stepping up into the waiting arms of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, when he calls us home. The fourth thing I want you to notice, the future promise was fulfilled in verses 17 through 28. God has a plan, and God works his plan. God has a plan for your life, and he wants you to walk in his will for your life, you see. In 17, it says, Then Eli answered and said, Go in peace, and the God of Israel grant thee thy petition that thou hast asked of him. And she said, Let thy handmaid find grace in thy sight. So the woman went her way and did eat, and her countenance was more, no more sad. And they rose up in the morning early and worshiped before the Lord and returned and came to the house in Ramah. And Elkanah knew Hannah, his wife, and the Lord remembered her. Wherefore, it came to pass when the time was come about, Hannah had conceived that she bare a son, and she called him Samuel, saying, Because I have asked him of the Lord. And the man Elkanah and all the house went up to offer unto the Lord the yearly sacrifice and his vow. But Hannah went not up, for she said unto her husband, I will not go up until a child be weaned, and then I will bring him, and that he may appear before the Lord, and there abide forever. And Elkanah, her husband, said unto her, Do what seemeth thee good. Tarry until thou have weaned him. Only the Lord establish his word. So the woman abode and gave her, gave her son suck until he was weaned. And when she had weaned him, she took him up with her with three bullocks and one ephra of flour and a bottle of wine and brought him into the house of the Lord in Shiloh. And the child was young, and they slew a bullock and brought the child to Eli. And she said, O oh, my Lord, as thou so liveth, my Lord, I am the woman that stood by thee here praying unto the Lord. For this child I prayed, and the Lord hath given me my petition which I ask of him. Therefore, also I have lent him to the Lord. As long as he liveth, he shall be lent to the Lord, and he worshiped the Lord there. The he in verse 28 is Samuel himself worshiped the Lord. He was the one that was there, raised by Hannah to know and appreciate faith in the Almighty God of Israel. 
Her faith and prayers were there as she prayed before him and helped him perhaps to learn how to pray. And indeed, she had instilled that faith in Samuel himself, for he had an important mission to play in the future. You see, in verse 24, it mentions three bullocks. There would be one for a burnt offering, there would be one for a sin offering, and one for a peace offering to be offered on the altar. Verse 24 also mentions a flower offering. Three-tenths of a ephra of flour for each bullock would be offered, and indeed one-tenth would be for the priest. Verse 24 also mentions a wine offering to be poured out for a drink offering at that time as well. Yes, indeed, God answered the prayer of Hannah. Elkanah and Hannah procreated Samuel. God hath heard my prayer. Hannah knew the motives in her prayer. She wanted a child for two reasons. First, she wanted to please her husband, and yet she was barren, you see. Second, her husband had another wife named Paniah, which means pearl, and Paniah was not a pearl of great price by any means, for she had taunted and made fun of Hannah on a daily basis. It drove Hannah to tears, and because of these two reasons, Hannah agonized before God. 2 Corinthians 1.20 says, For all the promises of God are in him are yea, and in him amen, unto the glory of God by us. Talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. All of us have had a time in our lives when a crisis or problems seems larger than we can possibly bear. And we become very fearful. Often, however, the Lord has to get our attention through such an adversity to call us to once more to rely solely on his promise, promises. The Bible scholars have pointed out that the phrase fear not appears in the Bible 365 times. That's one promise for every day of a year, you see. A reassuring promise for each day of the year, as I said, a daily dependence upon the divine promises is the only real remedy for our human fears. God's promises are yea and amen. The only assurance on which we can securely stand is on that solid rock of Jesus Christ. The gleanings from Hannah's prayer. Sometimes there are outward reasons that make us pray more fervently than ever before. I don't care what the reason is that drives you to your knees and to prayer. The question is, are you a fervent prayer warrior in your daily life? Remember, when you pray to, when you come to prayer, it's not how much time you spend in prayer, praying. It is how effective you are in your attitude and desire. When you really want God to answer your prayer, and you're willing to do anything, including to let go and let God act, and then God can answer that prayer. Hannah knew how to continue praying. She continued in verse 12 to pray, even though the Bible says she had poured out her heart before the Lord, and even after Eli the priest assured her that her prayer was answered, she continued to pray in verse 12. Notice how she continued her faith walk after her prayer. She went back home in full confidence. When we pray for it, we should believe that God is going to bring it to pass, and we should know that he is going to bring it to pass, whatever it takes. You see, Hannah worshiped the Lord, which her, was her way of thanking the Lord for an answer before she got it. So the woman, Hannah, went her way and worshiped before the Lord in verses 18 and 19. It is noted in the text that Hannah praised God. She said, My heart rejoiceth in the Lord. My horn is exalted in the Lord. I rejoice in thy salvation. There is none holy as the Lord. There is none beside thee in 1 Samuel chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. Note the presence of pra the absence of pra uh, praise from the father Elkanah. He was not burdened with prayer. He did not pray, so he did not have a basis for worship. On the other hand, Hannah was burdened. Hannah prayed, and Hannah had a basis for praising God because he answered her prayer. Other gleanings from 1 Samuel chapter 1. God is never surprised by our prayers. 
God knows our situation on a daily basis. He is not blindsided when we come to him and pray for things in our lives that we need. And he indeed is always knowledgeable of us. God was aware of the situation in Hannah's life as well as each of us in this present condition find ourselves today. God is aware. God was aware of the situation within the temple priesthood, you see. Eli's sons were not always doing the right thing. They were abusing their position. God knew he needed to make changes in the priesthood. Hannah's offer to give Samuel unto the Lord for service perhaps was the greatest answer that could be done. Families often dedicate their children unto the Lord. I dedicated my children when they were young. I'm sure most of us have done that. We prayed over them and laid hands on them and dedicated them to the Lord. And the church would indeed continue to pray for those children throughout their life. Families do this because they want to trust the Lord above all things with our children. Hannah wanted her son to serve the Lord. You see, God had a plan for Samuel, just like he has a plan for all of our lives, you see. Discover God's plan for your life and walk in his ways and you will be amazed at the outcome that takes place. Yes, prayer has been a big part of my life. Prayers prayed and prayers answered are the building blocks of our faith. God has healed broken marriages, increased the catch of salmon harvest, healed the sick, brought salvation to those without Christ, provided safe travel for travelers, kept people safe during auto accidents, brought rain, brought snow, stopped the rain, and indeed blessed me beyond my wildest dreams. Yes, God has answered many of my prayers, and some have not come to pass yet. But I know God is working on me and the ones I'm praying for. He's working on the ones you're praying for as well. Would you bow the knees of your heart and speak honestly and openly with God our maker in his son Jesus' name and allow the Holy Spirit guide you in your prayers as you pray. Be willing to be willing to follow the leadings of God. Again, I say, don't give up, don't give out, and don't give in. Stay the course in Christ Jesus. What are your priorities today? Are your priorities in the right order? How is your prayer life today? Only you can answer that. Are you moved by the Spirit to fast and pray in this hour of need for America, as well as our people and friends and our children and neighbors? Remember the effect, effectual, fervent prayers of a righteous man or woman availeth much. God is awesome. He is always open. He never dozes and he never closes. He's like the local fire department, but even better, you see. If you have never really accepted Jesus as a personal Savior, would you do it right now? Do not delay or put it off. If you would like to receive Christ by faith, prayer, Pray this simple prayer in your heart. Dear Lord, I acknowledge that I'm a sinner. I believe Jesus died for my sins on the cross and rose again the third day. I repent of my sins, and by faith I receive the Lord Jesus as my Savior. You promised to save me, and I believe you because you are God, and you cannot lie. I believe right now the Lord Jesus is my personal Savior and that all my sins are forgiven through his precious blood. I thank you, dear Lord, for your, sa for your saving me. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer, God heard you and saved you. I personally want to welcome you into the family of God as we prepare for our altar call. Father God, we come to you tonight. Use the words of your servant and indeed work in the hearts of your people and indeed show them the right direction and course. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, James. Tonight you've heard the word. Now it's a question of believing the word, receiving the word, and receiving the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. Even now, tonight, the Holy Spirit of God takes the word and deals with our heart exactly where we're at and leads us 
to where we need to be. And I know and I can sense the Holy Spirit of God revealing to me the things that are lacking in my life and how there needs to be that time that's set aside to just get alone with the Lord and realize that He and He alone can meet the needs of our life. So tonight we pray for decisions to be made. We know that the Word will never return empty or void, but it will accomplish that for which He sends it forth and it will prosper thereby. As we sing a hymn of invitation as God speaks to your heart, just let go and let Him have His way. You might want to sing along wherever you're at. And realize it's a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. For many years, I saw him as the Savior of the church, but didn't realize that he wanted to save me personally individually and there was a time i bowed the knees of my heart sitting in the very back of a large church and when that invitation was given i knew i knew that i needed him tonight if you're not saved be saved be saved if you are saved have a desire to identify with him as a believer and to plant your life in the life of a Bible-believing church. You do. God will bless. But you have to trust Him. We have counselors tonight at the phones. And if God has spoken to your heart and they, you need somebody to talk to, you just call us. The number is up here on the screen and, and uh, we'll give you our undivided attention that you might find Jesus sweet to your soul. Brother Dave. Well, thank you again for tuning in to this live stream. Thank you, Brother James, for that message and Brother Butch for leading the way. Um, we are anticipating... Uh, Resurrection Sunday, uh, this coming Lord's Day, and we would invite you to tune back in at 10:30, um, same same place, and uh, we'll be broadcasting a, an Easter service that morning, and uh, continue to do as as uh, as we are observe those 30 days to slow the spread that uh, the president has asked us to do. It does seem as if uh, some from some of these uh, press conferences that it's having an effect. We believe that's an answer to prayer as Amen. much as it is an answer to our behavior. And Amen. so um, thank you very much for, for doing that. Uh, pay attention to the things that come out of Washington and from Governor Abbott um, in, in Austin as well. And we are blessed to bring you these broadcasts each, each service. Amen. And we pray for you daily and pray you'll continue to have faith. We look forward to seeing you on this coming Resurrection Sunday. By this, uh, by this broadcast. Brother Butch, would you close us in prayer? Father, we just thank you for the time that we've had tonight. Lord, most of all, we thank you for Jesus. Thank you for your presence here tonight. We're excited about Resurrection Sunday. Lord, not just this Resurrection Sunday, but every Sunday we celebrate your resurrection. And so, Father, give us wisdom, give us your power, and we'll give you the glory in Jesus' name.